Hello and good evening, good morning, and good afternoon to our speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences of ACNS webinars in different parts of the world. We are back again with two wonderful lectures for you. The first speaker for today is Professor Alistair Jenkins from the United Kingdom. Professor Jenkins, who is the president of the Society of British Neurological Surgeons, is also a consultant neurosurgeon at the Royal Victoria Infirmary Newcastle upon Tyne. Professor Jenkins is invited faculty to various workshops and conferences conducted by the educational bodies around the globe. He specializes in vascular neurosurgery as well as skull based pituitary tumors, trigeminal neurology, and pediatric neurosurgery. He is an noted author who has published several articles in various peer reviewed journals. It's a great honor for us. And we are extremely grateful to Professor Jenkins for accepting our invitation to be a speaker at our webinars. Today is going to talk about a hot and burning topic, current global health scenario, which is COVID-19 and neurosurgery. The second speaker for today is Professor Takashi Maruyama from Japan. Professor Maruyama is the Associated Professor of Department of Neurosurgery and Faculty of Advanced Technosurgery, Institute of Advanced Biomedical Engineering and Science, Graduate School of Medicine, Tokyo Women's Hospital. He is also a visiting professor at the Fujita Health University. He is a prominent member of the Japanese Neurosurgical Society and is a member of its Protocol Review Committee of Oncology. He is an executive officer of the JCOG 1016, which is a phase three, grade three glamours. He has received several awards and honors for his contribution towards neurosurgery, including the Microsoft Innovation Award in 2013. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to be a speaker at our webinars. Today is going to talk about awake surgery in glamours. The chair for the first session of today is our Honorable President of the WFNS, Professor Franco Sarvade. Professor Sarvade is the Chairman and Department of Neurosurgery at the Humanitas University and Research Hospital, Milano, Italy. He is an noted researcher and an invited faculty to several workshops and conferences around the globe. He has published several articles in various peer-reviewed journals and most recently and notably regarding the topic of neurosurgery in COVID-19 epidemic. We are extremely thankful to Professor Sarvadev for accepting our invitation to chair the session of ACNS webinar today. The second chair for today is our honorable guest from Egypt, Professor Nasser El Gandur. Professor El Gandur is the president of the Egyptian Neurosurgical Society and is a professor and chairman department of neurosurgery at the University of Cairo. He is the current general secretary of the Continental African Association of Neurosurgical Societies. He is also the current second vice president of the WFNS at large. He is a member of the editorial board of many peer reviewed journals and is the editor in chief of the Pan Arab Journal of Neurosurgery. We are extremely honored that he has accepted our invitation to chair this session of webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of Lyukukato, I would like to welcome both the speakers and chairs to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia is my co host for today. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over the dais to Professor Franco Savadar. So, good afternoon, good evening, or what time, whatever is the time with you. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to introduce uh, the topic, uh, I mean, uh, Professor Jenkins and the, the whole topic of COVID and neurosurgery. I have been recently the chief editor of the issue of uh, neurosurgical focus on COVID and neurosurgery. Uh, what can we say from, from our view, from the view of a worldwide spectrum of reactions to COVID in neurosurgery as the World Federation? Uh, first of all, I just want you all uh, to tribute uh, uh, a thought to our colleagues who lost uh, their life and our friends in the battle of, uh, against COVID. More than 100 neurosurgeons died after COVID, and uh, recently two from India, two chair of departments, and two uh, young neurosurgeons uh, in training in Mexico and Indonesia, and uh, we are almost over 100. So uh, we also pay the tribute. Uh, what uh, did uh, we learn from the COVID uh, pandemic as neurosurgeons? Uh, first uh, teaching is that we are uh, doctors, we are physicians first and then neurosurgeons. Uh, our young uh, colleagues very often forgot until now that uh, neurosurgery is a branch of medicine, it's, it's not something uh, detached from medicine. And uh, at the beginning, when I remember, I, I, I'm working in the first place in Europe when in one year ago, in March 2020, the pandemic arrived and uh, we were overwhelmed. By two weeks, 
most of neurosurgical units in my area, in my metropolitan area, were closed because neurosurgeons were sent to COVID departments, anesthesiology were sent to COVID care, and uh, almost all elective surgery was closed. Uh, so we were almost hit by a storm. Uh, then we learned how to do it. And in the second and third way, we always kept open some part of neurosurgery with a small elective part at the beginning and then more. And also with uh, some part always keeping emergency neurosurgery alive, even in the most uh, difficult period of this pandemic. So we as neurosurgeons have been able to reconvert ourselves and to deal with the pandemic by reorganizing our words. And uh, also the pandemic has affected uh, the education. The trainees uh, were much less exposed to surgery. Front lesson almost disappeared. And the meantime, cadaver lab disappeared. So we had a, a complete rethinking of the whole educational process. And uh, about uh, three months ago or four, I have reviewed a paper from Africa where there was a sentence, which I, I will remember for the future. The sentence was that like now, every webinar exposed young neurosurgeons who, who could not travel before and did not have the money to go far away for complicated Congress or meetings, they are now they have the possibility to listen and discuss with the masters in neurosurgery. And this is uh, some of the few positive aspect of this disaster that we learned that we, with remote teaching, we can involve much more people in a process of education. And we can also deal with these uh, webinars and lessons and so on. Then we have to remember that we have done a lot in terms of protocols, guidelines, and um, our British colleagues who are now speaking after me were one of the first to deliver guidelines about how to deal with the COVID in, in the pandemic period. And we must be grateful to all neurosurgical community who has reorganized deeply themselves in, in the fight against COVID. So the conclusion is the, just a conclusion for me and just giving the word to Alistair, uh, the conclusion is that we, we will never be the same as before. And as we say in Latin, ex malo bonum, from the worst, the best. And we learned a lot in this situation. We will never forget what we have done in this part of our life. And nothing will be the same as before. And I think we personally and all the community of neurosurgeon will be better than before. So just please go ahead, Alistair. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh... Frank, you, you've just given my talk for me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Almost all of it. But thank you uh, to, to you, to Professor Algander, who's not quite with us yet, to Prof Krishnakati, uh, Prof Kato, and the Asian Congress for asking me to, to talk. I notice from the affiliations of the Asian Congress that the SBNS is not one of your affiliated societies. So please, I would be more than honoured uh, if, if you could possibly approach us for that, if you feel that we're worthy. Um, COVID has been a massive upheaval for the whole world, and uh, a lot of people have compared it to the Second World War. In the UK, the COVID death toll at one year is over a third of the total deaths in that conflict, military and civilian. We learned a lot of lessons after the First and the Second World War, and are we actually learning anything from the pandemic? Well, let's turn the clock back five years. In 2016, our government decided they would do a simulation of an influenza outbreak. Now, you may remember uh, that Bill Gates gave a lecture in 2015 
on global pandemics uh, being the next big thing. And you know that that is why there are so many conspiracy theories about Bill Gates and the vaccine. And maybe it was that, or maybe not, that stimulated our government to do that. And what they said was that it was actually a new strain of influenza had emerged in Thailand in June of that year. And within a month, the World Health Organization had declared a public an emergency. There were 950 people altogether involved, NHS organizations, prisons even, local emergency response, et cetera. And they were asked to imagine that they were in a worst case scenario of a pandemic. Up to 400,000 excess deaths were going to be called, caused. And they were in the seventh week, just at the height of the pandemic, when hospitals were getting really pressed. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Well, what did they find? And you can see the quote here that the UK was woefully badly prepared. They didn't have the policies, they didn't have the infrastructure, uh, and they simply couldn't cope with that. And one of the principal findings was that they couldn't find places in care homes to discharge people from hospital into. Again, does this sound familiar? Because they're mostly privately run. There isn't a joined up social care system in the UK. What did they recommend? Four areas of key learning, 22 further lessons identified from the exercise. And what did they do with this? It was never published. I had certainly never heard about it until the current pandemic, and I think that applies to the whole of the UK. So let's fast forward to 2020. Uh, news emerged from China at the turn of the year of uh, a new and very dangerous virus. And the Chinese have been criticized. They may have been secretive about some things, but medically they were not secretive and they were telling us exactly what was going on. Here we had daily new confirmed COVID cases. Now keep this graph in mind because they were testing and they were finding cases. Also keep the tail of the graph in mind, they haven't had a second wave. And there's nothing, as they say, more certain than death and taxes. With the exception of this funny little blip here, their deaths paralleled that. And they came down very rapidly here. And what the Chinese did was they shared this information. They sent us effectively the world, this handbook of COVID-19 prevention and treatment, which many of you will have seen, and which was absolutely superb. It told us everything about uh, how to deal with this, including simple slides like this, how to uh, put on personal protective equipment, PPE. Meantime, as Franco has just said, the virus had spread to Europe and Italy in particular was very badly hit. We were looking at pictures of military lorries queued up in Bergamo, taking dead people to mortuaries and being unable to, to cope with the numbers. And we were very scared. But Italy, and then this is Italy's graph here. Again, this is the difference. Over here, we were not testing. This is the whole time up till, up till now. And so the number of cases were not great, but the second wave, as you've heard, and the third wave were, were bad. Sorry, wrong direction. The deaths were extremely scary. So the number of cases was just uh, an artifact of, of the lack of testing. But Italy began to turn the corner just as the first wave hit Britain. So with all this information from five years, six years, and all this international collaboration, what could possibly go wrong? Well, unfortunately, the answer is all too clear, I think, to most of us. For those who don't recognize him, this is Boris Johnson, our Nobel Prime Minister. And I think what got in our way was politics, protectionism, protecting our nationhood, if you like, our economy, and a curious thing of exceptionalism, this idea that, well, this may happen to rather pathetic little countries like China uh, and Italy, and uh, you know, it's not going to happen to the UK because we're, we're special. Well, why, how did things pan out there? 30th of January, WHO declared an international public health emergency, and they said to governments all over the world to prepare for this, it was going to happen. 11th of March, 
Franco, you remember Italy entered full lockdown. We saw these amazing photographs of these piazzas that are normally crowded with coffee drinkers and wine drinkers and completely empty, followed very rapidly by Spain and France. So what was the UK saying at the time? Well, it was doing effectively what Sweden finally did. It rejected lockdown as they said the population wouldn't accept it. Now, Sweden has done badly in some ways, moderately well in others, but the Swedes, they, they know what they're doing. They left it up to the population. If you'd left it up to our population, we'd all be getting drunk and falling over each other and catching COVID. On the 19th of March, believe it or not, the UK downgraded the COVID threat from a level four, which is extreme, to a level three. Now, why did they do that? They did that because we did not have the amount of personal protective equipment available to healthcare workers and the public to be able to sustain the level four. So this was an entirely cynical approach. The lessons we learned from other countries, importance of track, test and trace. Korea was telling us this in March of last year. About halfway through last year, Boris Johnson awarded a test and trace uh, contract to one of his friends, an ex-jockey, and she has made a hash of it ever since. Protect the elderly and the vulnerable. We discharge patients in a panic from hospital into care homes without any testing. And our elderly care homes became hotbeds of COVID infection and death. The importance of personal protective equipment was known very early. We were very late in getting any contracts for this. And lockdown was done at extreme, uh, with extreme reluctance. And when it was lockdown, of course, it wasn't really lockdown. The borders were open for a frighteningly long period of time. The result of which was that after two months, type testing showed that there were 1,300 separate entries of COVID into the UK. The 22,000 people a day at one point were coming to us from Spain during lockdown. And this is a graph you'll all have seen of deaths per thousand at different ages. And you can see how it rises precipitously. And these were the people being discharged into the community. Similarly, percentage of patients in critical care with COVID who recover in blue and who die in orange, clearly going way, way down as you, as you get older. What was our response then? We assumed that most cases would be mild. Why did we assume that when we were actually seeing people, including doctors, dying in other countries? We thought we would build up herd immunity. And in fact, uh, there were several uh, prominent concerts and races and things like that which went ahead. But then the scientists got together and there's a scientific group uh, for emergencies which did some modeling and they said there will be 250,000 deaths which could be reduced by 90% with some simple modifying measures. And finally then lockdown was announced on the 23rd of March of last year. Two days later, Boris Johnson contracted COVID or revealed that he'd contracted COVID and everyone went into a meltdown. He was taken into intensive care and there were obituaries being written, but he recovered and in fact, uh, he, he did very well. And it gave the condition a certain amount of notoriety and people certainly began to take it rather more seriously. And this was the mantra of the time, the, the three word slogan, stay home, protect the NHS and save lives. Because the critical thing was to stop the NHS being overrun. It's, it's one of those things, if you could a pint, uh, a litre cup, and it's just 95% full, everything's fine. The minute it's over that 100%, everything gets wet. And it's the same with this. If we can't admit people to hospital and they're dying in the community or dying in ambulances, it would be bad publicity for the government. But to be not cynical for a moment, it would be a disaster. So what did they do? Well, they passed a... a a government act, the Coronavirus Act, which effectively meant they could do what they wanted. We think the government does that anyway, but there are some checks and balances. They demanded self-isolation of anybody with symptoms of COVID. And those symptoms, as you know, gradually progressed um, in, in our knowledge of them. 
and we got updated on that. And their families had to self-isolate as well for 14 days. And controversially, elderly people and people classed as vulnerable, so that could be anything from having had chemotherapy in the past uh, to having asthma, were told that they had to shield. And shielding meant not only did you have to stay at home, you had to stay inside your house and not go out and you could have no visitors. So really you were in danger, or we were in danger of substituting disability from COVID to disability from extreme loneliness and uh, inability to care for yourself. But the one absolute triumph of our government was the furlough scheme. Now, if you don't recognize that word, uh, I didn't either. None of us knew what furlough meant until the government introduced the scheme. What it meant was that you got paid by the government uh, while you were unable to work for your employer. So the employer did not pick up the tab and you were given 80% of your salary. And given that most of us were spending a lot less because we couldn't go out, we couldn't, we didn't need fuel for our cars, all that sort of thing, that was actually an extremely good deal. And that persisted for a very long time and was one of the things that has actually paradoxically saved the economy. But the principal message was stay at home. And we were very lucky actually at that time, there was a period of particularly good weather. I think if it hadn't been, the whole country would have gone into meltdown. But all these messages plastered everywhere, essential travel only, and the streets were completely empty. We also introduced uh, social distancing, initially two meters, and then something they called one meter plus, which was delightfully British and vague. It meant if you were, two meters away, then you were okay. If you're one meter plus, you had to wear masks and be particularly careful. And then um, we had to wash your hands. And later on, this became hands, face, space. When masks were introduced, wash your hands, cover your face and give people space. And it was, it was a good slogan, it was good. However, I took this picture recently. It does seem to me to sum the whole thing up. We'd built up a barrier, we built a great big gate but it was completely pointless because we were allowing people into the country who were carrying COVID, they were traveling all over the UK, uh, and it was too little, too late. We had wasted easily two to three weeks from when we should have locked down, during which time it's estimated we probably lost 20 to 30,000 people. Meanwhile, the National Health Service. The National Health Service is, is, is interesting in that we think we're the enemy of the world and the world doesn't necessarily agree, particularly America, but it is a good system. We really assumed that we were going to have a bad time because particularly we'd seen what was happening in Italy, a country of a similar size and shape, not very far away um, with similar infrastructures. So we very rapidly reassigned many of our wards and theatres uh, and some of our neurosurgical wards became COVID wards. The operating theatres became wards as well. Um, and we tried to separate COVID and non-COVID patients. The government decided that the hospitals were going to be overrun as well. And so to their credit, and we'll talk about this in a minute, they built what were called Nightingale hospitals after Florence Nightingale. And these were huge hospitals uh, which were equipped with ventilators and with everything that was needed to look after sick COVID patients. We had to stop all our routine admissions. We were not admitting anybody into neurosurgery except for, for emergencies. There were some little exceptions. For instance, battery changes for stimulators, refilling of drug pumps, things that you could actually get into serious health trouble without. And many staff, fortunately not me, uh, were redeployed in other areas and retrained to look after COVID, which gave us some scary sorts of scenarios. Uh, and this is the sort of thing that we were all worried about. And in fact, we did have a bad time for quite a while. And um, we were in danger of being overrun, but we never actually failed to cope. In Newcastle, we actually were taking some patients from London at one or two points and from other areas in the country, uh, but we're very good at that. It's a small country with good road links and we, we were able to do that and it worked out quite well. 
But there were scary statistics. We were being sent this every day. This is from our own hospital. This is roughly when lockdown was. And we watched as the numbers of admissions and the numbers in intensive care and dying became inexorably greater. And of course, this is a, a virus that has a, an incubation period of up to two weeks. So it's not enormously surprising. Two weeks incubation period, two weeks of being sick, and we're not over that yet. But of course, we had these brand new banking Nightingale hospitals. The great thing, wasn't it? Fantastic idea. This is Matt Han Hancock, our health secretary, uh, opening one of these. Look at all the social distancing going on. All very impressive. Uh, and this is what it was like inside and absolutely superb. These were converted exhibition spaces and things like that. Really beautiful, state of the art. But they'd forgotten one key thing. And I wonder if anybody can imagine what it was. Yes. Of course, they had forgotten the staff. The staff were all so busy being redeployed in other areas uh, that there was no tiny possibility of them coming and staffing a Nightingale hospital. So these four or 500 bed hospitals went completely unused. And again, it's difficult not to be cynical, but I think they were as much a publicity stunt as anything else. But the numbers did start to come down, as you can see. Uh, gradually. And finally, this is again our hospital admissions and people in, in infectious diseases units, HDUs and ITUs, progressively and fairly rapidly came down to about the beginning of June. Not so in some other countries, notable in the US, how very similar the first part of the graph was in the US to us, but where we locked down, at least mostly, and had social distancing, masks, etc. The US, in the shape of Donald Trump, resisted this, and you can see what happened. And of course, that was the, the main problem. Um, and you have to be careful who you listen to. Dr. Fauci, honest broker, superb analyst, many, many years of experience, but unfortunately, many people preferred to listen to Donald Trump. And he wasn't alone. Um, he made fatuous claims, as we all know, but many countries, and I would I have to say, I think India was one of them, said effectively that they had stopped COVID in its tracks and that it was all fine. And of course, this was all smoke and mirrors. There were some advantages to lockdown, as I've said. I'm a cyclist and uh, this was the sort of road I was looking at, absolutely marvellous. And it really, it was a, a pleasant time for some of us, but it was an extraordinarily bad time for many, many others. This is Newcastle Station, uh, having been in Delhi and Calcutta and various other places. Uh, I think um, you'd agree this is something that would be quite desirable. Unfortunately, the train companies did not feel the same. And there were some other little uh, predictable effects of being in lockdown. There were some things that you turned to. But one of the main problems for someone like me was travel. Travel simply disappeared. Uh, and when I had decided that global neurosurgery was going to be my theme for the SBNS presidency, that was stopped very rapidly in its tracks. In the two years before lockdown, I'd been to, I think, 15, 16 different countries here and with the, the Emir of Kano in Nigeria. And then uh, just immediately before we locked down in March of last year in Kolkata here. But 2020 passport, well, you can see where I've been in 2020. It's not really quite so, so exotic, is it? Barely even been out of Newcastle. But the one thing it has taught us, as, as we've said earlier on, was the value of Zoom and of these remote teaching. Um, and here's an example. This is with Richard Kerr, the author of ISAT. Um, and we were doing a, a vascular webinar with a huge number of trainees joining us. And, and really, these educational opportunities have been superb. We held our first SBNS virtual meeting in October last year, learned a few lessons from that, held another one last month, and they're getting slicker and slicker as time goes on. But let's hope that it's temporary. So back to Newcastle, what were we doing? Well, we had two operating theatres available every day, as against the normal four and a half. Nearly all elective cases were cancelled, and we did all our outpatient consultations by phone. Very interesting, those of you who have done that, 
you don't lose an awful lot. One of the things I teach the junior staff is that if you haven't made the diagnosis by the time the patient has stopped talking, then get them to talk again, because the examination will actually, in the modern era, sometimes add very little to that. We all got amusingly checked for our personal protective equipment. We got uh, fitted out because the masks only fit certain sizes of face. And some people like me have a large nose, which gets in the way. How do you practice social distancing when six of you are trying to put a patient onto the operating table uh, and the patient themselves is less than two meters long? It's, it's a joke. So you can't do it in a hospital, but we did what we could. Interesting, the hospital didn't do what it could. The hospital is so keen on getting its money's worth that there was no question of them letting us work from home um, or even take turns in, in turning up. But certainly for a while, uh, this is an expression borrowed from the um, First World War when, when war was declared but nothing happened in the UK. Uh, it felt like a phony war because our friends in intensive care and in the infectious diseases wars were having a terrible time. But we were really not doing an awful lot. We were effectively waiting for the call up like soldiers. So what did we do in those times? Well, people picked up their pen. They wrote many, many papers. And as Franco said, we sat and we wrote guidelines all the time. If in doubt, tell people what to do. The government was telling us what to do all the time with its daily COVID briefings. And our hospital was doing the same to us. We were told when to wear what different kind of PPE, but let me tell you, this was totally inadequate. I was visiting people with COVID wearing a plastic apron, arms completely exposed, rubber gloves, and an ordinary mask, because we simply couldn't get the imports. We were told how to prioritize surgery, and we took part in those discussions, obviously. We were even taught how to do telephone clinics. So people, realized that we were actually in danger. We had seen our friends and colleagues abroad dying of this disease. And one of the principal areas that was a problem was, of course, transnasal surgery, skull-based surgery and pituitary surgery. And this was one of the first pictures in the UK of people ready for this kind of surgery. Um, and uh, we were all set to go. We were all set to start bringing in more patients, trying to operate on them. We'd got through that first era of the phony war. And then suddenly out came this article, which looked at patients who contracted COVID around the time of their surgery. And what it found, uh, it looked at 30 day post-op mortality and the lung complications in over a thousand patients. And it showed that over 50% got pulmonary complications, and there was an overall mortality rate of nearly 25%. And this was probably due to cell mediated immunity problems. As you know, there are even anesthesia gives you some defects there. And also, at that time, the absence of an effective drug therapy, we'd only just discovered that dexamethasone worked. And this was the summary of it, 24% 30-day mortality, 51% post-op pulmonary complications, and in that lot, 38% mortality. So of course, there was a major impact in this. Surgeons became very unwilling to operate, unsurprisingly. The patients became unwilling to be operated on because they're no fools either. But as we went along, we all talked to each other and I was talking to my colleagues in the SPNS and saying, you know, this doesn't really seem to ring true. I'd had to operate on a couple of patients with COVID. Uh, one of them was a transphenoidal. I knew she had COVID, uh, but you know she was going blind. And um, it, it appeared that the real life risk was lower. Now we have no idea why the Lancet study found that, but we did not replicate that. Uh, but unfortunately, although we started all bringing more patients in, this is still widely quoted and widely believed. You've seen the first half of this graph, and then over the summer, everything was very nice, but sadly, as with almost every other country, apart from some in the Far East, we developed a second wave. And why did we do that? One of the major factors is probably that schools reopened. We all know that children don't tend to get COVID badly, um, but they can be vectors. 
and they are vectors, there's no doubt they bring it back home to their parents. Anybody who's had a child knows that you, you spend your first two years of your child's life snuffling and sneezing yourself because they bring all these things home. Having told everybody to stay at home, the government then went through 180 degrees and told everybody to go back to work. And this was obviously for economic reasons. So everybody obeyed the government and went back to work. They reopened the restaurants. Not only did they reopen the restaurants, they gave a financial incentive to people to go and eat out. And it was called Eat Out to Help Out. And it did the restaurant industry quite a bit of good for a while, but unfortunately, what then happened was it contributed to, to the second wave. Boris Johnson decided that he needed a bit of a, his popularity was dipping. And so he told everybody that they could go home for Christmas. And this was just at the point when things were kicking off badly. He was persuaded by the scientists to draw back on this, but he refused to give in completely. And he said that everybody could go home for one day. But very crucially, he delayed the implementation of a travel ban for two days, during which time everybody got on a train and went up north from London. And of course, we had, as we've, we've spoken of, variants from abroad, and then the new British COVID variant, which many of you will be all too familiar with. So this is the B1.1.7, um, first detected in September 2020. And we believe that it's more transmissible and more dangerous. And very rapidly, it became the, the dominant one. And what was interesting is, as I'll show you on the graphs, this spread in spite of lockdown procedures. So it proved that it was more transmissible. This is what happened locally in Kent. Very, very rapid growth in the number of people going into hospital. And this was how it spread throughout the UK. In Kent, down here in the southeast, September 2020, October 2020, and then very, very rapid rise, November and then December. And you can see that by February, there were massive, massive numbers and it was covering nearly the whole country, certainly everywhere in England. And what's interesting was this really was proof of Darwinism because what we saw, uh, this is the percentage of the total of the, the different variants, all other variants here, then a brief appearance of this GV variant, but you see that very rapidly, the Kent variant became more than 90% of the cases in the UK. And here we have uh, the UK, and this is really the effect of that. Here we have the second wave starting, then we have lockdown here, and then this is the effect of the, uh, the Kent variant. So in spite of lockdown, a, a massive spike. And in the north of England, where I work, this was even more accentuated because this was Boris Johnson's Christmas present. We were doing very nicely down here. And then all these people came up north, spread their virus, and then went home. And we had a massive uh, third wave here. And you'll notice also that the number of people in hospital as a percentage of the number of cases was greater, showing that this was not just a more infectious variant, it was a more dangerous variant. And this is how it spread around the world. In November, a couple of cases in Portugal, and then 31st of December spread pretty much around the world. But at that time, of course, the vaccine was coming on board. And the coronavirus vaccine is one of the major success stories of the pharmaceutical injury, uh, industry. I have never seen a graph like this. You'll all have seen this, the Pfizer graph. And the blue is people given placebo, and the red is people given the vaccine. And magnifying that first bit, you see that the two mirror each other, and then at 11 days, suddenly this becomes flat. And the second dose is going to be given somewhere around here. But in fact, the second dose was less crucial. And so the UK actually decided to delay the second dose in order to be able to give more people their first inoculation. And so we rolled this out to the whole of the, the country. 
uh, in age stages. So first of all, the over 80s and those in care homes, and then the over 70s, and then gradually it's come down. And today it's been announced that anyone over 31 has been invited for their vaccine. And there's absolutely no doubt that this is making a massive difference. We have not had somebody in hospital with COVID now for about a month. And that, that really is absolutely major. And of course, politicians are never slow to take the credit. And everybody has thought that Boris Johnson and his government are absolutely marvellous for rolling out the vaccine. In fact, the vaccine has been completely handled by the National Health Service without any political interference. And that may be why it's done so well. There have been some ideas about how to handle vaccine hesitancy, because there are a number of people who are concerned about having the vaccine. But what are the problems that we've had with, with this? Well, the first one is the obvious one. The people who, due to one conspiracy theory or another, believe that the vaccine is a bad idea. There are even people who still feel certain that COVID does not exist, that it's all a construct. I would simply invite them to come and work in our intensive care ward, or even come into my family, because we've lost people. For some reason in the UK, ethnic minorities uh, have been less happy about taking this on. And that can be a major problem in some of our inner city areas where there's a very high proportion. There have been, unsurprisingly, with something which is expected to produce millions per day flawlessly, there have been some production problems. And these have led to the vaccine wars that everybody's aware of, where people like the UK versus the EU, the EU versus the rest of the world, uh, America versus everybody. And this is predictable. It's, uh, for those of you who have read any English literature, the book Lord of the Flies is, is a very good thing, where you get a bunch of basically decent people put them in bad circumstances and they will start fighting. And then of course there are some genuine complications of the vaccine and the main one is this vaccine induced immunothrombocytopenia and thrombosis, VITT. This is a very rare syndrome. It occurs after the first dose only of usually the AstraZeneca vaccine, although probably the Johnson & Johnson one as well. And you get thrombocytopenia you get elevated D-dimer, et cetera, and you have a very high incidence of cerebrovenous sinus thrombosis. And it's very similar to the heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and thrombosis, except obviously without the heparin. This is what it can look like. These are our last three patients who've had this. And as I left on Friday, we had three people in intensive care. And the only thing you can do for these people is decompressive craniectomy after correcting the hematological problems. It's rare, one in 250,000, four per million. The mortality has gone down as we've recognized it more, but it's still not great. And there's a very high mortality if you have cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. We've been developing guidelines with the intensive care people and with the hematologist to get people to recognize it and manage it quickly. Because if you get it quickly, and it, I mean quickly, within a small number of hours, some of my colleagues in Cambridge have seen people come in with a headache and have fixed pupils within six hours. So it, it's, it's rapid. And this is a problem because this is meant to be the vaccine for the world, AstraZeneca, are producing this at cost price and um, it's it's the one that's going to go all over the world which is okay but it, four per million when you have populations like this I think you there is a small risk of replacing people in intensive care with COVID by people in intensive care with the vaccine complication. Unfortunately, Oxford and the AstraZeneca team are looking at this very carefully at the moment. But uh, right now, the, di the um, reason for it seems to be obscure. Well, at the moment, we are once again re-emerging from lockdown, although there are some threats on the horizon. And this time, we, are <laughs> we keep being told by the government that this time they're going to be led by science rather than by prejudice and it's going to be based entirely on numbers. 
but it's dependent on the numbers of cases, but also on the vaccine uptake, which very fortunately has been better than expected so far. And as I said, the effectiveness is very high. There is, however, a possible effect of new variants, and um, that I'll talk about in a moment. The economy, likewise, is recovering um, and uh, amazingly has gone up to 90 plus percent of its pre-pandemic levels. But that can only last so long. I think people's, what used to be called a war chest, their reserve of money can only last a certain amount of time. What has happened to us in the meantime? Well, we have the massive problem with education of our juniors that Franco alluded to, um, but we also have a massive problem with waiting lists. And this is the graph showing from January 2020, um, negligible waiting lists of people over a year. I mean, this didn't happen to now massive numbers. Um, and that is going to take probably years to get through. The UK is doing very well now, and that is actually only, I think, because of the vaccine. In general, most people would agree that as the third or fourth largest deaths per head of population in the world, we have done relatively badly. I think a lot of it is down to the government. Um, and it's interesting that, again, there are parallels perhaps with India and certainly with the US and with other countries. We were hopelessly late in coming to the party. The idea that we pursued some sort of herd immunity is, is just completely laughable. And the lockdowns were incomplete. We did not lock down, we simply reduced. But we have this problem, which this slide kind of summarizes of major comorbidities, heart disease, etc., in our population, but also the epidemic of obesity that's been seen in a lot of the more developed countries in the world. Two thirds of our adult population are overweight or obese. And there's a linear relationship between that and COVID morbidity. And there's also a lot of health inequality and education inequality, both of which have a major effect on, on, our, on our population. But the UK has done some things very well. We are quite good at obeying commands to borrow the Glasgow Coma Scale expression. And you know, things are done in a very orderly manner. And when we say we're going to lock down, you've seen the effects on the graph. It comes down, uh, then cases come down very precipitously. And we saw very tragically uh, the Queen, even at her, her husband's funeral, observing strict social, um, social distancing rules, wearing a mask, etc., etc. Some other countries, this is Brazil, which has, had, as you know, had a terrible time and again, terrible leadership. Um, and then what about India? India is a phenomenon. We know that this first bump for the UK, which is the red one, uh, was due to lack of testing. But India simply chanted along on the bottom here until very recently when the numbers started to go up. But surely that's going to be an artifact of testing. Well, look at the deaths. Again, we can't hide deaths. And we had this huge peak in the first wave, India, nothing. I remember being over in India last March, and everybody saying, this is going to be terrible, but nothing at all. And then this happens. And it's very tempting to, to think that this is something to do with a possible resistance to the earlier strains of the virus, because we all know India, I've been there many times, it's not the best country in the world to have a, a virus passing around because it is going to pass around this very compact population um, very, very quickly. But then suddenly along comes another variant. And maybe it's this that's caused that. Now this is, I'm not a health person at all, but it just seems very strange that we have this new variant coming on. And at the same time, the numbers in, the, in India are going up. There's certainly no doubt it spreads more readily. It is the dominant strain there. But in the UK, we're having doubling of cases every week. We had 3,000 last week. We think it is susceptible to the current vaccines. And my goodness, I hope so. Because I think the Indian variant is going to do for us what the Kent variant did in that graph that you saw where it takes over from, from all the others. 
And of course, how did it get to us? Well, in its wisdom, yet again, the government was letting people fly from India to the UK until two weeks ago. And they were being advised constantly by the scientists to stop this, but stop it, they did not. And so, of course, now we have renewed problems and this thing, a variant of concern in several areas of, of, of Britain. Uh, and you know, it, it, is, it is likely that it's going to take over. So here we are, we've got the virus. We are hoping that sometime soon we may be over it. And as we emerge from lockdown, this is our program. 29th of March, we've had this, outdoor sport allowed. 12th of April, shops opening. 17th of May, pubs, restaurants, entertainment. But we're all looking towards this one on 21st of June where all limits on social contact are, are lifted. There is a lot of worry about that at the moment. The government is determined to keep going with this, but the trouble is that governments all over the world see life as a beauty contest. They think that they need to look good. We don't want governments to look good. We want them to be efficient and to do the right things. What have we learned from this in terms of another pandemic or a recrudescence of this? Well, we know that lockdown works if it's done properly. What about masks? You look at this graph that you've seen before of the Newcastle cases, and this is the point in July last year at which masks were made compulsory. I've used the word cynical a lot, but a cynic could certainly look at this and say, well, it didn't make much difference, did it really? The fact is, and if you look at the few studies that have been done, there is actually a difference. And the number 70 odd percent comes up a lot. Wearing a mask does reduce transmission of the virus. Whether it reduces it enough to be incredibly useful, I don't know, but just wear a mask. Social distancing, well, social distancing is fine. If you take it to absurdity, you say, well, if we're an infinite distance apart, we can't possibly get it. And if we're right on top of each other, we will get it. The two meter rule was reached at a point when people said that this could only be spread by droplets. And they did various studies in physics where people would speak to each other, they would track the droplets and the droplets fell to the ground at one meter. So they said, okay, two meters. It didn't spread by aerosol. I remember being told this by our own virologist in the hospital. Well, guess what? It does spread by aerosol. And maybe social distancing is not as useful as it, as it might be. But for sure, what works is vaccination. And the more celebrities and politicians who allow themselves to be photographed being vaccinated, the better it's going to be for all of us. So what lessons have we learned? We don't have enough scientists in government. Our prime minister is a classics graduate and knows absolutely nothing about science. I think statistics should be compulsory for every politician. <laughs> we do not listen to people who've had experience, whether it's the Chinese who we're very suspicious of, the Italians who we think are just disorganized <laughs> or who it may be. And we don't listen to the, to the scientists. Lockdown means lockdown. It doesn't mean you let your friends in through the back door because you think they're going to bring money into your country. You'll lose more money in the long distance because the biggest threat to the economy may not be the direct one that you think of. And new ways of working may continue. Um, we have learned a lot of new ways of working. A lot of people, not so much in hospitals, are now working from home. And many big businesses in this country have said, well, there's no reason not to continue that. We can monitor what people are doing by their output. And if they're happier, then some of their work can be done from home. Um, we have learned a number of things medically. And I think uh, those, as Franco said, will make us better people and will make us better doctors. And our NHS um, and its advantages have been recognized for its huge role in, our, in seeing us through the pandemic in this country. But I think let's not forget that this knowledge has been achieved at enormous cost. 
in terms of loss of friends, loss of relatives, and loss of colleagues around the world. And let us just hope, ladies and gentlemen, that the end will soon be in sight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alistair. I think, as far as I understand from Raja, that we have uh, quite a few minutes for some questions. Is it yeah. uh, any question from the floor? Any question or comments? Thanks, Professor Jenkins, uh, for a very nice uh, presentation. A few questions for you, Prof. Uh, in the era of uh, different hotspots now around the globe, uh, in your opinion, how uh, does global neurosurgery with helps? Uh, especially uh, outbreak in certain countries such as India, because all this while uh, neurosurgical services uh, in most countries are over dependent on general ICU. Uh, we, I think, uh, over overall in the world, we do not have such policy that uh, neurosurgical facilities should have their own ICU. So, in because mm -hmm. of that, the first thing lost in neurosurgery actually is their ICU because it's shared with the general, and that's most of our cases cannot be done. And thankfully, earlier we have locked down, mean less road traffic accident. But now we do not have locked down because of the economic uh, are more important. So, in your view, how does this global neurosurgery helps uh, in 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 those countries that that is hit by the COVID at this point in time? Thank you, Professor. I think one of the interesting things I've noticed in this country is that there has been zero response in terms of actually building new facilities apart from these Nightingale hospitals. They are not what we need. What we need is more facilities in our existing hospitals. And I think one of the first things we need to do is lobby the governments to get to increase our bed numbers. And we, we've done that locally, but we did it at the expense of taking over operating theatres and people's offices and things. But a small amount of building, even some porta cabins, a tent, anything at all that will contain patients. I think the other thing, and Franco alluded to this, that we've learned is that when the rest of the hospital is fussing about COVID, we don't have to lock down completely. And we, we did exactly the same, I think, as they did in Italy, which was that we stop working. We stop putting anything through. But in fact, what we did in the second wave was, if you like, we titrated our ability to operate against the availability of beds. And we simply made the best of what was available. The trouble is COVID is very rapid in its, in its development and, and we can't always do that. But most patients, if you talk to them, would rather be canceled on the day of surgery than never have had the opportunity to come in at all. The trouble is at the moment, what's happening is that things, for instance, pituitaries, I gave the example, we're saying to them, we can't operate at the moment. We put them on a waiting list and then they become an emergency and the outcome is less good. I don't think there is an answer to your question, um, and certainly not one that I could give you from British experience, but I think we have made the mistake in the UK of throwing numbers of surgeons at a problem that is to do with facilities. And if instead of buying surgeons, we built operating theatres, or in, in, in the case of we built intensive care facilities, then I think we'd be doing a lot better. And they're not that expensive. No, uh, one more last question, Prof. Sorry. Alistair, uh, can I ask you a question, Alistair? Yeah. Yeah, uh, this is, you know, you told about uh, uh, AstraZeneca vaccine producing vaccine induced uh, thrombocytopenia with uh, bleeding. And uh, mm. it comes after the first shot in such patients. Uh, so why it doesn't come after the second shot is my first question. And such patients who develop uh, such a problem, uh, what about giving a mixed match regime? Uh, give a, a mRNA vaccine rather than a DNA vaccine as the second shot. Your thoughts on this? Well, I think <laughs> I have thought about this a bit. And I think that there is a, the, the reason that you don't get it with the second shot is that everybody who is going to get it gets it with the first shot. <laughs> Um, it's not a, it's not an induced immune problem. So you don't get a bit sick with the first one and then very sick with the second one. I think it's probably just an overwhelming response of the body to something in the first shot. And the people who've gone on to get a second shot are the people who have not been very sick in the first place or haven't died. 
Um, certainly people who've been very sick with the first shot have not been given the second shot. So yes, they will be given a different, uh, if they survive, they will be given a different a vaccine. That's absolutely true. But I think the, the reason it's not with the second shot is simply because it will always get you in the first shot if you're going to get it. Does that what make sense? about mixed match, mixed match regime? Second shot being a, a different mRNA vaccine. Is that followed? Yeah, well, if you have a problem with the first one, then yes, give us give a different one for the second one. But for people who haven't had a problem with the first one, we haven't had any who've developed it with the second one. Does that make sense? And we are we're actually talking about doing mixing and matching anyway. There's a couple of trials going on to see if there's any advantage of having both types of vaccine, the attenuated strain vaccine and the mRNA vaccine. Um, but you know the, the fact is that the results of both are better than were ever predicted. We imagined we get 60, 70% success rate. Yeah, the, the Pfizer one is over 90%, which is extraordinary. Thank you. I would like to mention that the people, there is a registry currently, which is going on in three countries, uh, Italy, UK, and more countries. And they have found that uh, this antibody is developing to platelet four is the main cause of VITT mm -hmm. and yeah. is seen in younger patients and more in females than in males. But uh, there is no statistical data to support this. Correct, and it's factor four, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's interesting that we've now had, I think, about 300 or more cases in the UK. And if you look at them, actually, there is no correlation with age and there is no correlation with gender. We thought it was all the younger people. We thought it had a predilection for females. But in fact, if you look at all the cases and statistically analyze them, it's not. So that, again, is, is worrying because several, several countries have said, oh, let's just give it to older people. And that may backfire as well. My, my concern, as I said, is that on a small scale, it's a tiny number of people. But you start producing this for the whole world and you're going to have an awful lot of sick people around. I think they've got to find a, uh, an answer sometime soon. Yes, Dr. Stranko. Yeah, well, just a uh, last comment. We, we had a case last week, uh, two weeks ago, of, uh, of sinus thrombosis after a trauma with a fracture crossing the transverse sinus uh, and uh, bubbles of air. So it was a cl classic uh, thrombosis, post-traumatic thrombosis. We went, uh, a journalist came to our hospital and then we went to every newspaper that we had the complication of vaccination. So mm -hmm. there is a, a classic uh, emotional reaction. I mean, as you have shown, Alistair, we have one case in 250,000 which is much if we talk about the world, but the, you believe that the death per aspirin dose of 350 milligrams in, you, in Europe is one in 350,000, not much difference. So we, we see that the disease, every 100 people who take COVID, three or four in Italy will die. So, the, there is a disparity between the, the benefit and the disadvantages. Obviously, we are scientists, we need to study it, but we need to put in the real good context with the population. We cannot tell them we have a, a large number of uh, thrombosis. Then, I mean, people will not accept to get the vaccine and they will die because of COVID, the old ones. So, so this is something who is happening. So I really appreciate your presentation. Very seldom we see the scientists and the doctors talk about the politicians as you have done. And I appreciate it a lot. I mean, I am with you. Uh, we, we have to do like this. We have to say that healthcare problems are solved by healthcare workers and the healthcare experts. Uh, politician can tell because they take into account a large spectrum of reasons and they must be re-elected. This is what happening. Yeah. But uh, people dying in your countries, in my countries, we have almost 130,000 people who died. 
so in both countries. So something went wrong and should not be the same in the future. Thank you Absolutely. very much. Alistair. Thank you very much. We have one comment from Dr. George Wellingalam, Professor George Wellingalam. Are you here? Yes, Raja. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, a very fascinating talk uh, by Dr. Jenkins. And uh, I must profusely thank Raja and Liu for all your you know, untiring efforts. Just a quick comment. Uh, in the second wave uh, that we have seen in India now, uh, a very worrying problem that has come up is uh, the rhino cerebral uh, mucormycosis. In fact, uh, one of the hospitals in Bengaluru yesterday had nine cases uh, of mucormycosis on the ENT list and two cases on the neurosurgery list. So just uh, mm -hmm. a view of uh, Professor Jenkins on that. And uh, the second uh, quick question is that uh, one of the figures that we are often missing out in the heat of the pandemic is the non-COVID morbidity and mortality. Patients, you know, losing their life, waiting for surgery, for brain tumors, or for perhaps, uh, you know, for epilepsy surgery, causing sudden unexplained death in epilepsy. So, death. so the non-COVID mortality and uh, your views about mucormycosis. Thank you. I think that the non-COVID mortality is, is a very difficult one, and that is something we have, again, to sort of titrate up our level of activity against the threat to our hospitals from, from COVID. And I think we, we have to simply, this is why we in this country developed these priority lists for every single specialty of what should be done. You may think it's incredibly obvious, but actually when you've got somebody with a, an acoustic fighting against someone with a lumbar disc or a glioblastoma, it's not that, that easy. And so I think we have to be very careful not to lose these people to tell them what to look out for in terms of problems and to review them as often as we can. From the point of view of mucormycosis, I have not heard of a case of that here uh, associated with the, uh, with, the, the vir uh, with the vaccine. In fact, I would go so far as to say I think I've only ever seen one case of that in my entire career. And so that may be a demographic difference between the UK and India. And if it is going to be a a side effect, maybe we will not see that. But that's very distressing to hear. That's a horrible disease, absolutely horrible. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, we'll wind this up. Before that, I would like to mention I'm the right person here currently to comment on this because I, I was rescheduled on and rostered to the general COVID duty uh, last week. I'm an associate professor here and suddenly I went back to taking pulse BP and saturation in a PPE kit. Uh, it was uh, really an eye-opener. As Professor Franco Sarvaday in his uh, newsletter of WFN has rightly uh, wrote that, uh, do not forget, we are all basically a part of medicine. <laughs> so uh, we would like to thank Professor Jenkins and Professor Sarvaday and all the distinguished faculties who have joined. We'll move on to the second lecture. Bye, Please. everyone. Bye, Bye. Nasser. Bye, Bye, everyone. I'll give this dais to Professor Nasser El Gandur to say a short introduction and invite Professor Mariama. Thank you very much, yes. Raja. I would like to thank Professor Yuko Katu for giving me such opportunity to be the chairperson of the second session in this important meeting. And like to thank Raja and all the organizing committee for such opportunity. I think Raja, you will introduce our next speaker. Yep, we have already introduced Professor Takashi Mariyama. You can okay, okay. invite him for the lecture then. Professor Mariyama. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Takashi Mariyama, working in Tokyo Women's Medical University and also start working with John Adra, Zap Surgical. Uh, it is great pleasure uh, to have this opportunity, and uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Yoko Kato and uh, 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 Raja for the organization. Uh, uh, after the serious topics, I'm afraid that my talk is a little bit uh, uh, clinical, and it's not that sweet of a time in the COVID-19 situation. Actually, I did first, uh, I did second vaccination yesterday, to, so uh, today I have uh, fever and joint pain, and I'm afraid that my brain working for a good English. Well, anyhow, uh, now today's my talk is awake surgery for glioma, mainly focusing on the motor awake cases. 
There are several steps to master awake surgery. I recommend motor awake uh, in the initial phase of awake surgery. Awake surgery for motor location glioma is very simple and easy to evaluate function. Also, awake surgery need to have experience in the team, including a nurse and an astrologist. For the learning curve, experience of motor awake will be the fundamental to achieve a speech function awake surgery. So let's go to the slide. Let's start uh, from the beginning. Uh, the thinking about the tumor growth pattern of glioma. Glioma ori ori uh, originated in subcortical over subgidal sectors, and it expand on the axis. Then in the early phase, it grow to the subcortical and short association fibers. Then, then spread over in the advanced phase to the neighboring subgyla and long, long association fiber and commissural fiber. So uh, motor function evaluation consists with subcortical layer functional mapping and also subgyral sector mapping such as pyramidal tract. So the first question is, do we need awake surgery for primary sensory motor cortex brain tumor? This is a natural history of a conservative treatment. Uh, Mitchell Burgers group published uh, the uh, natural history uh, of low-grade gliomas. The initial volume was not so large, so then observed the patient. Then they found that uh, the uh, mean volume per year is 4.4 minute uh, millimeter. So uh, in the low-grade glioma. Uh, watch waiting, then a tumor uh, will glow soon or later. And uh, the observation, correlation with PFS and pre and post-operative tumor volume, and also functional mapping, hazard ratio 3.26. Also, this is a paper mentioned about the comparison of a strategy favoring ID surgical resection versus the watchful waiting in low grade glioma. The five years survivors, five years survival was uh, obvious that early surgery, uh, five years survival was better than biopsy cases. Especially the malignant transformation, the biopsy showed 56% versus uh, the aggressive resection uh, showing 37%. Here is a paper mentioned about meta-analysis of 19 reports, uh, more than 8,000 patients of functional mapping. And functional mapping removal contribute to gain of total removal rate and decrease the severe neurological deficit. Here is a paper mentioned about Mitchell Berger about uh, motor cortex tumors. They divided into three zones, such as uh, uh, medial portion at uh, foot and track, at uh, zone one, and zone two is arm and hand, and zone three is orofacial. Their uh, reports say that uh, they uh, had severe uh, cases in 10%, however, 90% of case. Uh, were uh, not a severe deficit and they complete a tumor removal. So let me show you uh, the first cases. This is a 44 years old man, uh, the tumor locating just on the precentral gyrus. And tractography is showing that foot pyramidal tract to land and uh, uh, medial portion of the tumor. During this surgery, the cortical uh, MEP disappeared. However, we did remove this tumor under subjective patient movement. Let me show the video. Now we are opening central circus. Direct stimulation of precentral gyrus up to six milliampere did not show any positive response. Just as with the tumor, the leg motor function was uh, uh, appeared. In the lateral portion, 
the BAPS is showing that it's not that highly malignant. Now we are opening the central sulcus to the bottom. In the bottom of the central sulcus, we found foot motor response. We try to not to damage any artery and veins because we do not uh, want to damage the cortex of the blood flow and blood supply. Now we found both hand and the foot response. That means pyramidal tract response. Here, transcranial, uh, transcortical MEP working. And also we ask patient to uh, move uh, his, his leg by himself. His subjective move was weakened and suddenly foot MEP disappeared. Then we asked the patient whether he could move his foot. He says that the, it is weakened, but still uh, he can move his leg. So MEP monitoring did not work. So we asked the patient to keep his uh, foot laid up. In the bottom of the cavity, we still find the foot motor response with two milliampere. And also uh, we confirm his subjective movement of his foot. This is a final view. So aim of awake surgery of motor glioma is the robustness of functional evaluation. There are three different types of monitoring, such as transcranial MEP and transcortical MEP and subjective movement. If you do without awake surgery, you need to use transcranial and transcortical MEP. However, sometimes the uh, electrode dislocation and uh, sometimes cortical MEP is unstable. If you do awake surgery, you can monitor both transcortical MEP and also subject movement and also direct stimulation. Sometimes subject moving movement uh, disappeared because of the tot palsy or blood flow or SMA syndrome. So these three monitors, you have to evaluate whether fit types of monitoring should be suitable for the patient. The monitoring condition for motor glioma is that in awake, we use transcortical MEP, SCP, and subject movement. And no awake, we use both cranial and transcortical MEP. And also rationale for combination of MEP and awake surgery is securing against instability of MEP device implantation and instability of localization due to functional field shift, confirmation of muscle contraction other than that of the muscle to fit the electrode is inserted. So this is a setup of transcranial MEP. As you can see, the upper limb and lower limb, you need to uh, insert the electrode in the certain muscle. And also uh, stimulating electrode must be placed on the, uh, around the central sulcus area. Uh, however, prob problem of transcortical MAP is transcranial MAP is that they, they must have a false positive such as potential decline in brain shrink caused by CS drainage and also bilateral decline of potentials. Also, simulation point is deeper so that you cannot evaluate. This is uh, uh, because of the motor cortex or pyramidal tract and they have a false negative. So during the uh, monitoring, uh, 
simultaneous measurement of the transcortical trans MEP is needed. Of course, we need to have a threshold uh, of the MEP. There are some papers mentioned about uh, a threshold. Uh, so this must be the one that you have to evaluate by your own experience and your own hospitals. So the placement of transcortical MEP. The tumor uh, locating in the uh, frontal lobe and you can visualize placental gyrus. Then uh, electrode must be placed in the uh, medial side for the foot motor and lateral side of the hand motor. Or you can place electrode just on the placental gyrus. If tumor locating just on the placental gyrus, then you cannot find the uh, light place of the uh, insertion. Of course, if you have a space, you can insert uh, electrode medial and also lateral for the hand motor. Sometimes we place the electrode on the post central gyrus. And uh, especially the uh, patient uh, paralysis of the foot uh, decreases the patient uh, ADL so that uh, the foot motor monitoring is the most important. And you have to see the, uh, uh, the motor, uh, motor response, uh, the, the percentage of decrease. This is another case of 45 years old maid. Uh, the left side, uh, middle frontal gyrus tumor. The tumor is just on the presenter gyrus, but you can see uh, residual uh, normal cortex, uh, just posterior of the tumor. This is a tractograph and also uh, with TMS, uh, we found the uh, hand response, the lateral from biceps and uh, tibial anterioris, uh, we found the foot response in the medial side of the tumor. This is anatomy, a uh, tumor is locating in the center, in the middle of central gyrus. In the medial part, we found foot motor response with two milliam, and uh, the left lateral border, we found the hand motor with two milliam. Let me show the video. The hand motor response, foot motor response. <clears throat> now we start a gyrectomy. We try not to damage any uh, passing artery and veins. Sometimes I use temporary clip to uh, confirm uh, whether there is no uh, decrease of MAP response. Usually we open the sulcus to the bottom. Then we stimulate the border of the uh, cortex. In this place, we found that uh, the patient uh, have a response of his body trunk. So we can predict that we are getting closer to the pyramidal tract. The knee response, you can see the response on his foot. So we try not to go further. Now we ask the patient to do his uh, subject movement. We, use the, we dissect the tumor under uh, his subject movement. The final view. Yeah. 
in the bottom of the uh, removable cavity, we found the pyramidal tract running, such as two milliampere stimulation showing the leg, side, body trunk, hand, and the forearm. So uh, we, are, uh, we uh, dissect the tumor just next to the pyramidal tract. This is after the two days after the surgery. Uh, during the surgery, transcortical MAP of arm decreased 10% from the original response. So just after the surgery, uh, he is uh, slightly weakened. However, now he's fully recovered and he can play golf and now. So uh, the reason to cause uh, MEP inaccuracy. In the pre-operation pre setting, long history of motor weakness and also large tumor and the medial side location, the MEP monitoring showing inaccuracy. During the surgery, brain shift, dislocation of a grid electrode, and so blood flow and SMS syndrome is the reason for inaccuracy. Now we are showing the MEP invalid case. This is a 29 years old man. Uh, his first surgery was done in 2008 and diagnosed as grade two astrocytoma. After six years, his tumor was returned back and uh, uh, you can see that the flare high area uh, spread uh, on the placental gyrus and transferred to our hospital. Uh, tractograph is showing that the pyramidal tract lining just a uh, posterior side of the tumor. TMS showing that the hand response is uh, uh, was the lateral side of the tumor border. But this is uh, uh, this was a recurrent case, so that uh, we cannot see clear DTI image. This patient. Uh, the MEP of the arm uh, didn't change. However, leg of the MEP showed no any response so that we did uh, remove tumor with his cooperation, such as subjective movement and also direct stimulation. We found the response on his uh, foot. Now we found the response on the posterior wall. So MEP monitoring did not work. So we asked patient to keep moving his uh, foot. This is a central area of uh, foot response. And now uh, we did find the pyramidal tract running like this linear foot, linear uh, issue. Okay, uh, this is a MEP buried case. Uh, the patient is 52 years old female, uh, left present uh, tumor, uh, mainly in the middle frontal gyrus. Transcortical MEP shows that uh, the upper uh, was decreased but recovered, and also lower cortical MEP showed increased the, after the tumor removal. Uh, her subjective move was dropped. Uh, we didn't see any uh, her subject movement. However, cortical, we did surgery with following cortical MEP confirmation. 
Here's anatomy and the placental gyrus, postcentral gyrus, and the tumor is here. Just after the removal, we found that pyramidal tract running like this way. Let me see the video. Primary sensory response. Now he's saying that his half finger is moving. Confirming all facial motor response. In the medial portion, the lower response is higher. Just next to the lower portion, then upper upper reaction and lower reaction uh, gradually changing, switching over. And in the far lateral part, we found uh, the hand motor response. From this video, we found that the tumor is locating just between the foot motor, foot motor fiber and hand motor fiber. Tumor is locating and we stimulate this bottom line of the uh, transient zone between foot and hand area. There's a post-op. So, uh, advantage of combined awake surgery, awake and MEP is uh, we can compare automatic motion and MEP uh, deviations. If MEP down and automatic movement is still uh, keeping, then we go to, uh, we keep this uh, tumor removal. MEP equal automatic movement down, we follow the MEP. MEP down, automatic move down, then we stop surgery. In some, uh, the awake surgery sometimes having uh, in case of insufficient awake condition. At that time, we cannot follow any patient subjective uh, movement so that MAP will be the key monitoring of removal. The, this is a case of dominant hemisphere middle frontal gyrus. Middle frontal gyrus tumor is uh, uh, usually does not show any symptom. However, this portion, there are many functional topics. This is a pre-op, and uh, here's a posteriorly, uh, you can find a motor response at the placental gyrus. This is uh, uh, this picture showing after tumor removal. This middle frontal gyrus, uh, after the removal, you can find many uh, neurological symptoms. Middle frontal locations, uh, in the medial portion, there is a SMS syndrome uh, caused by frontal Ashland tract. Also in the middle, the lower portion of the middle frontal gyrus, you can see frontal eye field. And also the, in the bottom, you can uh, uh, find a language function just next to the uh, frontal opercle. This is a slightly higher of the middle frontal gyrus. And well, let's see. Uh, now, first, uh, the coach come up in. We found. We found the hand response and the face response. Now we are starting removing the uh, portion 
of the border zone of the inferior frontal gyrus. This is a medial portion. This is a posterior portion. We open the sulcus with subpyal dissection. And in the bottom of the sulcus, uh, we stimulate and see what happens. Speech arrest. This is the border between uh, inferior frontal gyrus and the middle frontal gyrus. Well, uh, this is a location we found conjugate deviation. It is rare, but sometimes you can see the conjugate deviation during the surgery. Now I open the uh, inferior frontal sulcus. You can see that eyeball is moving to the light side. It is rare to find this conjugate deviation. However, uh, this area, sometimes you can find the conjugate deviations. Now I'm going to about the frontal ashram tract. Well, in the uh, medial part, I stimulate the subcortical area. This is far from the uh, placental gyrus. However, we still see the hand wrist response, motor response. Also, now we are going to the inferior part of the removal cavity. She shows speech arrest about bulb generation tasks. He still can't say anything. This is a wrist motor response. There's a conjugate deviation site. And also uh, the bulb generation disappeared. This site is far from the uh, precentral gyrus. And also uh, slightly frontal from the uh, language eloquent area. So, well, it must be the uh, symptom caused by frontal ashram tract. This showing the frontal ashram tract anatomy. This is connected through the uh, frontal operculum to the SMA area and uh, uh, Stimulating this area uh, sometimes cause non fluency speech and bulb generation and also negative effect on, of the motor movement. So uh, this is uh, the data from my colleague. Uh, during uh, last 15 years, uh, 10 years, uh, we, uh, we summarized 30 patients with motor area gliomas and uh, let's say 50% uh, of the patients showing MEP decline. And also, uh, well, uh, as for the surgical result, the extent of the resection is mean 93% and median was uh, 95%. And also the motor deficit 
the severe motor deficit was just one patient, and the others uh, have a good uh, good uh, result. The threshold of MEP is at 50% uh, decline. And once the MEP uh, uh, declined uh, below 50%, then we stop uh, tumor removal. Of course, sometimes you cannot continue awake surgery because of the uh, patient reasons. This patient at the first surgery, we did try uh, to remove tumor with awake surgery. However, her awake condition was insufficient. So we stopped tumor removal. Then we did uh, chemo and radiotherapy. Then watch over the tumor growth. Uh, after two years, uh, she showed uncontrollable epilepsy. So we did the second awake surgery then we complete tumor removal. So uh, the awake surgery, we should not force uh, uh, the patient. Awake condition is important. I, I, we, we should make a patient uh, condition comfortable. Well, uh, there is a learning curve of awake surgery and also uh, the motor awake is uh, a fundamental of which I told uh, in the beginning. Uh, the essential of motor awake is uh, controlling awake conditions. And also uh, we could learn direct stimulation techniques. Also, we can manage and we have to make a uh, good team management. After that, we can do large tumor and also language uh, glioma tumors. If your team is uh, going to be matured, you can try uh, this, uh, this such a large tumor. Also multilobular type tumor. And also uh, this technique is spreading uh, all over the world. Uh, we did first awake cases in Vietnam in 2019, before the COVID-19. Unfortunately, we can visit Vietnam now. However, this time we did awake surgery with my team and uh, the patient is doing fine after one year. And also uh, we can, we are communicating with the Vietnamese neurosurgeon as a neurocommunication. And uh, uh, we do some discussion and we try to keep contact with Vietnamese neurosurgeon. So uh, awake surgery is one of the technique and uh, uh, we cannot do awake surgery for the awake surgery. It is just a technique. So we can use both a uh, cortical MEP and awake surgery. However, this technique may uh, contribute to the patient. And also I hope that my presentation will help to understand for the young neurosurgeon Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this great talk. And uh, it is very illustrating uh, presentation. Actually, we learned a lot from your presentation. Thank you very much. Raja, you have any comments? Yeah. Okay, can I ask a question, Raja? Yes, sir. Yeah, what an excellent talk, uh, Professor Kachi. But uh, how will you, just, uh, what will you look for in the right frontal excellent track? Left, you told about motor speed. Uh, what about left side hemisphere? How will you monitor for uh, a frontal excellent track? We know it extends from Broca's area to uh, supplementary motor area. Uh, so, left correctly, you told you look for speech, motor speech function. And I know, I have read that. Articulation can still remain normal, but you know, fluency of speech goes, which you told correctly. But how about the right side? The right side, you know, frontal and excellent tract is known for executive functions and uh, also mem uh, working memory. So, will you touch for working memory when you do a right side stimulation, subcortical stimulation for uh, frontal excellent tract? Right side. Okay, uh, thank you very much for good questions. Right side aslant trap. Uh, well, the first of all, uh, 
do we do allergic surgery on the right side, the middle frontal gyrus? That is the first question. Uh, sometimes we skip uh, uh, allergic surgery because, uh, you know, uh, then you can monitor uh, MEP for the uh, water. But however, uh, some papers mentioned about the connection between left side and right side frontal gyrus. Uh, sometimes uh, the language and network uh, right side frontal uh, are involving in the uh, speech construction. So uh, actually I have experienced right side a frontal glioma patient showing the speech difficulty just during the surgery and the post-operatively. However, the dominant hemisphere is left side, so our right side frontal glioma removal that did not cause any permanent deficit of the speech function. But uh, the ashram tract itself is, I my personal opinion is ashram tract is uh, the uh, function of negative motor activity, so that uh, the uh, the language itself uh, it, it does not cause uh, the uh, function to the language itself, but also uh, the negative action of the orofacial monitor uh, movement. So that means, uh, and also the ashram tract, the damage of the ashram tract may not cause permanent deficit. It uh, spontaneously causes uh, uh, post-operative deficit. However, usually it recover. So you don't have to care about light side, but still uh, the learning the uh, mapping technique, uh, the Ashram tract is one of the important and interesting part. So it will be educational. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor, I would like to ask that there is always a risk of intraoperative seizures in awake glioma. So what is your protocol for management of when a patient gets an intraoperative seizure? Uh, yes, uh, before the surgery, we give mm -hmm. patient anticonvulsant uh, advance. Uh, and also during the surgery, well, there's no uh, way to prevent epilepsy. So uh, use uh, ice cold serin and uh, try not to uh, uh, stimulate high voltage uh, stimulator. Uh, and also minimize uh, uh, st stimulation. So uh, that is the uh, only point that I cannot, you know, I, I, I can tell, you know, uh, that, that means uh, the experience, you know, the younger doctor who does not have such experience, they stimulate and stimulate, and stimulate, then it, it causes uh, epilepsy. So uh, once you get familiar with it, you can minimize the amount of stimulation. Yes, thank you very much. That's my course, Lubin Sen. Uh, thank you, Raja. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Maru Yama, for a very nice uh, presentation. I have three questions for Professor. Uh, first, uh, Professor, you mentioned that MEP dependent uh, for a weight cranotomy for motor cortex glioma. Do you have any uh, evidence to show that added advantage by having a weight cranotomy? Uh, in those cases. My second question is, Prof, uh, in, in, if you have a case uh, with a flare sequence uh, show the, the involvement up to the cortex uh, in the motor strip, do you still use trans-talcus approach or you can go, go for transcortical approach? Uh, my last question, Prof, you show a last case that uh, residual tumor that you wait for years and then uh, and patient develops seizure and you go in for a second time. Uh, and we know clearly that neuroplasticity does happen in the uh, language area. Do you found the same thing happen in the motor area? Thank you, Professor. Uh, okay, uh, let me uh, answer the third question. Uh, the plasticity, that is very important. And uh, uh, we confirm the language area plasticity. You know, uh, the between uh, two to three years distance, I found that the, all the language function and uh, move and shift from one gyrus to the other. Uh, the motor function, I am not sure whether uh, the motor functions move uh, because uh, the, uh, uh, the length and also uh, the simplicity, the motor uh, network is very simple, like a pyramidal tract. 
uh, the speech function, there are so many networks. And also uh, in the frontal area, the speech function is spread over and each uh, and divided in, into uh, different functions. So the, the plasticity of the language is uh, free acceptable. However, I have no answer about uh, the plasticity of motor fiber. And what uh, was the first question? Uh, first question, uh, the advantage of awake cranotomy uh, in MEP dependent uh, resection. Uh -huh. Well, uh, I think that, that sometimes uh, uh, in the beginning phase, uh, the initial phase, awake conditions sometimes uh, uh, cannot keep stable. No, in the beginnings of the wake surgery, the patient is fine, but uh, uh, taking time, patient exhausts, and also sometimes patient fall asleep. That means we cannot keep a good uh, awake condition. In that case, MEP works. You know, uh, so uh, this is uh, MEP is one of the uh, uh, safety uh, for such an uh, insufficient awake. Condition. So I don't want to compare only MEP removal and awake removal. So I want to use as much as possible for the patient. Thank you very much. Thank Raja, you. I, I, have, I have a question over the Q&A panel. Okay. Can I say it to Dr. Takushi? Yes. OK, the question is from Dr. Harshad Patish. He says, do you do deep seated tumors awake, and what about thalamic and corpus callosum lesions? Uh, good question. Well, uh, uh, deep-seated tumor. Uh, I think that the deep-seated tumor, we cannot do functional mapping because uh, it is so complicated. And especially in the deep frontal regions, they uh, must have a cognitive function, and sometimes they have a, a high level uh, cognitive functions. We cannot evaluate uh, such a high level cognitive function with stimulation. Uh, in that case, I don't want to use any stimulation, but just uh, make a patient awake and try to keep uh, talking with the patient. I'm afraid that if patient showing some difficulty of the conversation, that means maybe patient showing some cognitive dysfunction. So uh, in some case, I do awake surgery in the deep seated frontal region. Uh, also the, in the temporal, uh, temporal region, uh, I sometimes use uh, just observing the uh, memory and also the conversation. I cannot find out any uh, precious uh, function for this temporal area also because the posterior language area is very complicated. So, uh, however, uh, sometimes it works. It is uh, uh, just observing patient condition then uh, if you, but at that time you have to uh, do everything so quick. You cannot force the patient to keep awake for uh, long hours, two or three hours. So, uh, well, uh, so answer is yes. However, uh, and also corpus callosum. I cannot figure out how corpus callosum works during the surgery. So I usually do not do awake surgery for corpus callosum. Thank you very Thank much. You. We short comment from Takashi Kon. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mariam, for a great lecture. So I'm always learning from you and your institute members. So um, I admire the uh, uh, development of work surgeries and contributes to your uh, your your uh, your technique, your your uh, your your work. So I want to ask about the patients of the multilingual uh, patient, multilingual patients and non-Japanese patients. Uh, how do you identify the mother tongue uh, area, mother language area, and is there any are there any difference between uh, Japanese and non-Japanese or multilingual patients? 
Well, that's a very good question. I have experienced trilingual uh, patient who showing Italian, English, and Japanese, and mm. we couldn't find out any difference between Italian and English. Mm. Uh, well, usually, uh, well, uh, in the frontal, uh, we could not find any difference between a uh, mother language and the second language. However, we don't have such a patient, uh, especially posterior language area. It is very interesting. And if I could have a patient, I, I definitely do so. However, uh, you know, the patient uh, using uh, mother language, but living in the different country and the second language going to the mother language uh, is uh, uh, sometimes complicated. I have one Korean patient who mm. speaks good Japanese. He is uh, living uh, more than 20 years in Japan. So mm. almost his uh, mother language is Japanese. However, uh, just after the surgery, uh, he speaks good Japanese, but uh, the, his uh, mother language, Korean, uh, Hangul, uh, he felt slightly difficult. However, just uh, uh, that, Sooner or later, uh, the function recovered uh, both uh, Hangul and Japanese. So uh, I think that uh, the, it is uh, interesting. And also, uh, if we have a patient in the posterior language side, posterior, uh, posterior language area, mm -hmm. then it will be the point. However, uh, well, uh, I have such, uh, I have just a small experience. Uh, mm -hmm. I have no. Uh, good answers for your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very I much. Appreciate. I think it's time. We can wind up this session and also the webinar. We can go back to our chair to get his concluding remarks. Professor El Gandur. Yes, I'm very happy about uh, this great presentation and uh, about this great discussion. I think we have a uh, lot of information about our craniotomy. Maybe I just wanted to, to make two comments uh, to Professor Takeshi and maybe like, uh, like just uh, inquiry. I think uh, something very important is anesthesia. And if you have proper scalp anesthetic block, that's going to be the key for success. That's something which is an important message for the young neurosurgeons who are following our activities now. My second uh, comment is that uh, if you have an asymptomatic patient uh, with low-grade lesion, like low-grade glioma frontal, and very small in size and discovered incidentally, what do you suggest uh, to wait or to operate? Uh, I think most of the functional neurosurgeons would like to operate uh, to avoid malignant transformation. I don't think, I don't know if you agree about this or not. And if you agree about this and you find the patient is rejecting the operation, how are you going to follow up this patient? Thank you. Should I answer? Well, yes, please. Uh, I found a small or tiny uh, brain tumor such as low-grade glioma. Well, uh, I usually follow up and uh, we observe the feather. Uh, the, uh, they have a rapid growth. Uh, no, uh, sometimes I keep watching for more than 10 years. Some patients did not, uh, do not uh, uh, increase, some do. So uh, once we found the increasing the size, then we uh, start the discussion with patient to whether should we remove uh, when the size is small or should we wait until uh, uh, growing a little bit more? Uh, in that time, I have to uh, tell uh, tell a patient about the possibility of Marjoram transformations. So patient decide which way uh, he goes. Hey, Professor Takashi, and how frequent you repeat the magnetic resonance imaging? Uh -huh. For the low-grade glioma, uh, we usually do three to four months. Every oh, three okay. to four months. OK, thank you very much. I think, I think it's great discussion, Raji. And I don't know if anybody uh, would like to, to make any other comments. There are no it's time to close the session. session. We will close this session.
Professor Jenkins, any comments from your side? No, nothing, nothing from mine uh, about the last. Uh, it's just very interesting to see how much that field has changed since I first started uh, a number of years ago. And it's just so encouraging to see you, uh, Dr. Mariama, sending it to other countries as well. And I think that was one of the nicest things was the, the link with Vietnam there. So thank you for that. But thank you very much for inviting me for this. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much. So with that, we'll end this session for tonight. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kaito, I would like to thank both the speakers for today, Professor Alice Jenkins and Professor Takashi Mariyama, as well as the chairs, Professor Franco Sarvade and Professor Nasser Al Gandur, who took out their time in support for the ACNS webinars. We are extremely grateful to all the speakers and chairs. Thank you, my dear co Dr. Liu Boon Seng, for joining, and all the distinguished faculties, Professor Suresh Nath, Professor Takashi Khan, and all other distinguished faculties who have joined today for our webinar. So until we meet on next 26, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you, everybody.